Welcome to lecture one in mechanisms of brain dysfunction. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to cover the material from chapter one. We're going to focus on uh, the the components of nervous systems. We'll we'll talk about uh, the cells that make it up. We'll we'll talk about neurons and glia. We'll talk about the overall organization of nervous systems, and then uh, we'll touch very briefly on how we study uh, brain function with an emphasis on on how we study human brain function. Uh, Largely, the focus of this class is on neurons. These are the uh, specialized cells that um, uh, carry out rapid communication uh, with other neurons as well as target tissues like our muscles uh, or our, our organs. So when we say that neurons are polar, what we mean is that they have two ends, kind of like a, a magnet. So they have a, a receptive end, that would be the, the dendrites, and, and they have a, uh, a shipping end or a sending end, that would be the, the axon. Uh, located centrally, we have the cell body. Uh, the cell body is uh, essentially your, your typical cell. It has the uh, nucleus, it carries out protein synthesis, uh, and this is where signals from the dendrites are going to get uh, integrated. So the neuron can determine whether it has received um, uh, sufficiently excitatory input to then propagate a, a signal down its axon or, or not. Now the, the terms cell body and soma are used uh, interchangeably. So sometimes you'll hear somatic, that just means something to do with the cell body. The dendrites are these tapering extensions coming off of the cell body. You see them uh, located uh, uh, surrounding that cell body in the in the upper illustration there. And there are many different uh, dendrites that can come off of a neuron. Some uh, only have one. Some will have many. Uh, these are going to be tapered and branching. And, and this is... Uh, where the neurons receive a bulk of their inputs uh, from from other cells, the axon is uh, is not tapering. It's it's uniform, but it still branches so that the neuron can communicate with many different targets. And it's the axon that's going to transmit signals. Uh, those signals are called action potentials, and we'll be talking about uh, the uh, ionic basis of those uh, in subsequent lectures. The, uh, the interface between two neurons is what we call a synapse. All right? That's the junction between uh, a neuron and its target cell. It could be another neuron, uh, or it could be a, a muscle cell, for example. Synapses are, for the most part, chemical. Uh, so the one neuron is going to spit out little chemical signals uh, that the target cell then receives. Some synapses are electrical, where the electrical impulse traveling down the axon uh, jumps directly to the neighboring cell. Uh, these are a minority of the synapses out there. And what these synapses look like, if you zoom in on them, uh, you can see that we have our, uh, our presynaptic uh, terminal there on the left. It's full of these little bubbles called vesicles. We're going to talk a lot about those later. They're filled with those chemical messages that will be passed to the, the postsynaptic side. So uh, on, on the left, we have an axon, and on, the, on the, the right there, labeled post, we have the dendrite. And surrounding that, we have a glial cell. It's been pseudo-colored yellow here. Uh, this is just a little electron micrograph, so there's really no colors. Uh, but you can clearly see that very dark electron-dense region there. That, that's where we have our receptors, the proteins that will receive the chemical signals trapped in those little, little circular vessels in the presynaptic terminal. Now, uh, we didn't really mention the cell body there with the synapse, but the cell body is very important. It will receive synaptic inputs. Uh, its major job, though, is to carry out protein synthesis, and neurons are certainly specialized to carry out a ton of protein synthesis. Uh, these are fairly complicated cells with huge membranes that they fill up uh, with protein, so they have to of course make those proteins. They carry out transcription and translation uh, in their cell body. Some translation will also occur in the dendrites. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You can find what we call nissel substance, uh, which is just uh, essentially a collection of ribosomes in both the cell body as well as the dendrites. Uh, as far as we are aware, uh, there's no protein synthesis in the axons. So everything that enters the axon was made in the cell body. Dendrites can have some uh, local synthesis. I assume that everyone here has taken a basic biology class and is familiar with all the organelles uh, and there won't be any confusion about what a nucleus is, an endoplasmic reticulum or a Golgi apparatus. Um, if you need any clarification on that, uh, email me. Okay. Now dendrites, uh, like I said, sometimes there's uh, one dendrite that comes off, sometimes there's many. Uh, 
Okay, uh, the dendrites that come off of the cell body are what we call primary dendrites, and then as they branch, they form secondary, uh, tertiary, and quaternary dendrites. Some dendrites are, are highly branching, uh, some are fairly smooth, uh, and then some dendrites will have uh, what we call dendritic spines, and we'll be talking more about those later. These are little tiny protrusions. They look uh, they look like little spines, little thorns, essentially. Um, they come off of the uh, dendrite itself. So dendrites are, are highly, highly variable. Um, if you look on the illustration on the left, you can see a pyramidal neuron labeled PY. This has a very nice apical dendrite coming up, uh, then it branches. Uh, the interneuron to the right of it, it's more star-shaped. It's more uh, evenly distributed with its dendrites, so the dendrites just surround the entire cell body rather than having a few main primary dendrites. Uh, so different neurons will have a, a, a different number of dendrites that branch differently and may or may not have dendritic spines. The axons uh, are the, the portions of the cell that are going to transmit signals. So uh, if a neuron has received sufficient input in its dendrites, uh, or if it's generating these signals all on its own, it's going to transmit the signal down its axon. That signal is going to be the action potential, and that originates at what we call the axon hillock. Okay, this is the, the portion of uh, the, it's, it's where the axon meets the cell body uh, or the soma, and there's a ton of sodium channels. As we'll see uh, in following lectures, sodium channels are very important for action potential production. The axon can be very short, uh, or it can be actually uh, very long. Uh, so here we can see uh, the axons of a few different neurons. So the neuron on the left there, the axon is colored red and the dendrites are colored blue. You can see that the axon is actually much, much bigger than the dendrites uh, and it covers a fairly large region. Uh, whereas the neuron on the right there, uh, in this case the axon is colored black and the dendrites are colored red. Uh, again, the axon is bigger, but it stays more in a local region. So it totally depends uh, on where this neuron is trying to communicate. If it's going to communicate uh, with your big toe from your spinal cord, then it has a fairly long axon. But if it's going to stay within this, uh, you know, little millimeter of tissue or so, then it's, it's going to be what we call a local circuit neuron rather than a projection neuron. Some, ax some uh, axons are going to be covered by a substance called myelin, uh, which will speed up the propagation of that action potential, and we'll, we'll see this in following lectures as well. Uh, that myelin is produced by glial cells called oligodendrocytes, and uh, we'll, we'll see a slide on them in just a moment. But what the oligodendrocytes do in, in the brain, they, they, they wrap around the axon, uh, kind of insulating it, like the, um, the rubber insulation you'll see around copper wires. And what that does is prevent the leak of, of the electricity that's traveling down the axon uh, and allow it to move more efficiently. Uh, toward its target. And the ultimate goal of transmitting the action potential uh, is to cause the release of neurotransmitters. So here's our action potential right here. Uh, you'll, you'll see this in great detail. We're going to have a very rapid depolarization uh, followed by a, uh, a brief after hyperpolarization. So this, this is going to make a whole lot more sense uh, later on, but what you can see there is that this neuron is resting at around negative 62 millivolts. Uh, then once it receives some uh, input at its synapses, you can see that the uh, membrane potential becomes slightly more positive, then it becomes greatly positive. Uh, actually crossing zero millivolts and reaching a positive potential relative to the outside, and then it comes back down. If this seems very complicated right now, just wait. Uh, lecture two will clarify this. Okay, but keep in mind, all we're doing is creating an electrical signal, and that's what we're looking at here. Alrighty, so some neurons are going to be inhibitory. What that means is that they will release neurotransmitters that cause other neurons to stop firing. Those neurotransmitters would be GABA uh, or glycine. Okay, these are inhibitory neurotransmitters. They're going to bind to GABA or glycine receptors and um, prevent the neuron from being excited. So what we're looking at on the right here, we're looking at uh, action potentials being fired, right? Those are those little spikes, those vertical ticks. Okay, that's that action potential we just looked at, but uh, 
over a much shorter time course. So whenever you deliver a current directly to this uh, dopamine releasing neuron, that's what daergic means, dopaminergic, you can see that it quickly starts to fire action potentials and that the frequency increases as you deliver more current. All right, That's what that little plus 100 picoamps means. You're delivering 100 picoamps of current and it's a slow ramp. Below that, it's the same neuron, but what they've done is activate local GABAergic neurons. So that uh, neurons nearby that are forming synapses with this dopaminergic neuron are releasing GABA, and that GABA is inhibiting uh, the firing of action potentials here. Inhibitory neurons tend to be local circuit, although you find a bunch of projection uh, neurons as well. Uh, typically, there's no, um, no dendritic spines and you tend to find that kind of uniform star-like or stellate dendritic arbor. Um, on the other hand, some neurons are excitatory. That means when you stimulate them, uh, they're going to cause their next neuron, the one that they're synapsing onto, to then most likely fire more action potentials. Uh, and if we look at this figure here, those vertical lines, those are action potentials. Okay, they're recorded a little differently, so they look differently, but every vertical line is an action potential. And that blue bar is showing you uh, when I've uh, actually stimulated a, a nearby excitatory neuron that's going to dump glutamate onto this neuron that I was recording from. And you'll notice there's a lot more vertical lines there. There's more neuronal activity because glutamate is excitatory. So glutamate and to some degree acetylcholine these are excitatory neurotransmitters. Glutamate is by far the most uh, common excitatory neurotransmitter in our central nervous system. Usually excitatory neurons will have spines on their dendrites. Um, they can have a number of different shapes. Uh, some can be stellate, but you're, you're going to see uh, pyramidal neurons, those ones that have uh, very well-defined but uh, very few primary dendrites. You'll find some local circuit uh, excitatory neurons. Uh, you'll also find projection neurons as well. Uh, then we have what we call neuromodulatory uh, neurons. These are neurons that release uh, neurotransmitters that might be excitatory or might be inhibitory depending on which receptor they bind to. Uh, these would be the catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, more on this in, in later lectures, uh, or serotonin. Now these are almost exclusively projection neurons because very few neurons in the brain make these neuromodulatory transmitters. Unlike glutamate and GABA, which are ubiquitous, uh, the catecholamines and serotonin arise from very few nuclei within the brain, so they have to traverse long distances. Okay, If only one small area in the brain creates dopamine, everywhere in the brain needs it, so those neurons have to project throughout the entire brain. Uh, these neurons also tend to pacemake. What that means is they always fire action potentials. They're always releasing their neurotransmitter. Uh, the reason for this is that it allows us to sense an increase or decrease in activity. Okay, so we're constantly transmitting those action potentials. And what that translates to is a constant release of neurotransmitter. So here's our synapse again. On top we have our axon, and on the bottom we have our dendrite. The axon is releasing those chemical transmitters, uh, which in this case are little yellow circles, uh, and they're binding to their postsynaptic receptors there on the bottom. So if you have an increase in the frequency, the postsynaptic neuron will know, because there will be more uh, neurotransmitter. If you have a decrease in activity, the, the postsynaptic neuron will know that as well. If these neurons weren't pacemaking, you can never have a decrease. If they're at zero, you can't go any less than zero. So pacemaking is, is, is very important uh, for allowing bi-directional signaling, both an increase and decrease. The synapse is, is a, a very important uh, junction. This is what's connecting our two neurons together. Like I said, uh, some are electrical. Some allow that charge that's moving down the axon uh, to move directly from the axon to the dendrites of the next cell. Okay, um, For those of you familiar with your cell biology, these are just simply gap junctions. Little holes in the membrane that allow the cytoplasm uh, to be continuous between two cells. For the most part, though, most will be chemical. 
okay? Most of our synapses are going to uh, require the release of chemical signals called neurotransmitters um, at the synapse, and they have to traverse some space to then bind to receptors. Now, if you look at chemical synapses, they're all fairly similar. Uh, the presynaptic site is usually at the axon. It's not always. And the site of neurotransmitter release is called the active zone. This is where little vesicles of neurotransmitter are fusing with the membrane and releasing those neurotransmitters. At the postsynaptic site, uh, these tend to be on dendrites and uh, cell bodies, but not always. Uh, here we find the receptors, the proteins that bind neurotransmitters. Uh, they're going to be held there, they're going to be held in place with a, a collection of uh, the cytoskeleton and some adapter proteins which we call the postsynaptic density and that's simply because it's electron dense. When you look at it in an electron microscope it's very very dark as you can see in that little end set at the bottom left corner of the illustration there. The synapse itself is very very dark and that's because of all those proteins there. The proteins are going to uh, absorb a lot of the electrons and thus appear dark. The uh, synapse is going to be held together even though it doesn't look like in this cartoon. This cartoon is, uh, of course, too good to be true. This isn't showing you the, the adhesion uh, molecules that are actually holding these two portions uh, together, the presynaptic and postsynaptic site. All right, and there's a great number of these. The good news is for this class, you don't actually have to know uh, any of the adhesion molecules. You should just know that the axon and dendrites aren't floating in space. Okay, they're, they're, they're held together. Depending on what kind of synapse it is, the morphology can be very different. Um, excitatory and inhibitory synapses tend to look very different from one another. They're all about the same size. You typically see a diameter somewhere around 150 to 450 nanometers. So that's 150 to 450 um, billionths of a meter, fairly small. And the distance between them is around 20 nanometers. Okay, so these, these pre- and postsynaptic sites are very, very close to one another. That's why you have to have high-resolution electron micrographs to see these. The excitatory synapses are going to tend to appear uh, asymmetrically. That means that the postsynaptic membrane uh, will be thicker than the presynaptic membrane. Uh, you'll also tend to find these at the more distal portions of the dendrites and on those dendritic spines. If you see a synapse on a dendritic spine, it's excitatory. Inhibitory synapses are going to be found on more proximal dendrites and cell bodies so that they have a stronger control uh, over uh, the, the electrical signaling in a nerve cell. They also tend to have more symmetric membranes. Um, the thickening of the membrane that occurs at excitatory synapses uh, doesn't occur at inhibitory synapses. Uh, so you tend to see um, very similar thickness uh, when you're looking at uh, an inhibitory synapse. Luckily, you guys don't really have to worry about looking at electron micrographs and determining whether it's uh, excitatory or inhibitory. Uh, but you should be aware that these synapses uh, are, are very, very small. Okay, We're talking about billionths of meters here. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about glia. Uh, glia are the support cells. Okay, and there's a, there's a, a, a wide range of these. In the, in the brain, we have oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and microglia. The Schwann cells are located outside of our central nervous system, um, and they perform the same function as oligodendrocytes. Okay, both oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells are going to synthesize myelin. That's that fatty substance that wraps around axons and insulate it. So in order for our brain uh, to function properly, uh, we need to have rapid signals being propagated uh, between our different brain regions. Now, uh, all of us here are lucky enough to be vertebrates, and that means that we use myelin. But invertebrates, they don't have myelin. They instead just increase the diameter of their axons. But this can only take you so far, OK? Uh, as you increase the diameter of your axons, that requires that you have uh, bigger and bigger and bigger heads as you have more and more neurons. So by using myelin, we can pack more neurons into a smaller space, uh, and thus we can, we can have more complicated brains. So the fact that we use myelin is a very good thing. All right? This has allowed us to have um, much more complex brain function. And that myelin is going to wrap around axons. What we're looking at here is many, many layers of myelin wrapped around an axon. So AX 
is the axon. There's a mitochondria there. That's the MIT. And that MY is myelin. So what we've done is slice through an axon. Okay, so the axon is coming out of the screen here, uh, and, and we can see layer upon layer of myelin surrounding the axon. It's insulating it. It's preventing that electricity that's running through the axon from leaking out. What this is going to do is increase the speed at which a, a neuron can communicate by, one, by about 10 to 100 fold. All right, and we'll see more on this later. Um, the, the signal is going to then jump. Okay, it's not going to just uh, move passively the entire length because myelin doesn't cover the entire axon. Instead, there are these little areas that are covered by myelin. Those would be the internodes. Okay, it's only the myelinated regions uh, where the signal is speeded up. And then between each little myelin sheath, we have what we call nodes of Ranvier. And these are exposed areas of the axon. No myelin here. Here is where the electrical signal recharges. Because as it moves passively through the myelinated regions, it actually becomes a little bit weaker. Okay, because that, that electricity that was built up is now spread out through that entire myelinated region. So it becomes a little bit weaker. All right, if we're going to project from our spinal cord to our big toe, we need to make sure that the signal doesn't get degraded by the time it gets there. And so by having these nodes of Ranvier, we allow the signal to recharge itself. So we have little proteins there called ion channels that will allow more electricity to be produced. All right, we're not going to see any details on this this lecture. Uh, that's going to be uh, the focus of uh, lectures two and three. So the glial cells that carry out myelination in the central nervous system would be the oligodendrocytes. These create a very compacted uh, form of myelin. There's not a lot of space between the different sheets. They are right on top of one another, uh, and there's very little extracellular matrix uh, and extracellular space as a result. So very, very dense myelin. Each oligodendrocyte will also myelinate multiple axons and multiple segments. So oligodendrocytes are all about creating compact myelin and to save space. Because again, if we're going to have very complicated brains full of neurons, we have to figure out a way of packing more into a smaller space, otherwise we'd have heads the size of our houses. In the peripheral nervous system, uh, outside of our brain that is, Schwann cells are going to myelinate axons uh, and, and try to maximize their durability. Okay, because you're moving your arms and legs and bodies around in the world, you might bump into things, and when you do that, you don't want to damage your nerve cells. So the Schwann cells each Schwann cell is going to wrap around one little segment of a single axon. They don't hit multiple sections like oligodendrocytes. Instead, they're going to focus on one area and they're going to create a, a very cushiony, uh, uncompacted myelin with a lot of extracellular matrix to kind of hold fluid there and create that cushion. The Schwann cells are going to create a nice cushion they're going to uh, remove any damaged cell debris that's there, uh, and, and they can actually allow tissue repair to occur if we do get some nerve damage. If you've ever gotten a very deep cut and you've, you've damaged a nerve uh, in your hands or arms, there is some um, regenerative capabilities there, unlike in our central nervous system. If you damage your spinal cord, the oligodendrocytes there actually inhibit tissue regrowth. And that's why spinal cord injuries uh, lead to uh, irreparable paralysis. So we have our oligodendrocytes and we have our Schwann cells. Both of them are creating myelin. The oligodendrocytes created in our brain and spinal cord. The Schwann cells created uh, outside of our central nervous system. Astrocytes are another type of glial cell. Um, these play uh, important roles in maintaining uh, proper chemical homeostasis in our in our central nervous system. You don't find astrocytes in the peripheral nervous system, just in, in the brain and, and spinal cord. Um, these are very important for development. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about development here, uh, but the astrocytes are going to secrete a uh, little guidance cue so that so that neurons know where to send their axon to. Uh, the, the astrocytes are also going to be very important for clearing neurotransmitters. Okay, so once a neuron spits out neurotransmitters, okay, here's that same uh, electron micrograph that we've looked at. Now it's in cartoon format. So that presynaptic site, 
once it spits out those little yellow vesicles of neurotransmitter, what happens? You know, is the neurotransmitter going to sit around all day and continue to stimulate the postsynaptic site? Uh, that that wouldn't be good. Okay, that would lead uh, to hyperexcitability, which can actually be toxic. We call it excitotoxicity. You can overstimulate a neuron and kill it. It also create a lot of noise. Now we we want to send very quick signals. We want to fast on, fast off, and the only way to do that is to clean up your mess. So after the neurotransmitter has been spat out. We need something to clean it up, and that's the job of the astrocyte. Astrocytes are going to have a number uh, of, of neurotransmitter transporters so they can take it up. So when we spit out glutamate, our, our postsynaptic cell gets a brief exposure to it, but then the astrocyte and local neurons will then clean up uh, the glutamate. If we don't do that, very bad things can happen. Uh, what we're looking at here uh, would be some glutamate transporter knockout mice. Okay, what they've done in this experiment is take normal mice and compare them to mice that lack glutamate transporters in their astrocytes. So their astrocytes are no longer picking up glutamate. If you look at panel A, you're just looking at the growth of, of the mice. Uh, the, the open circles, so the white circles, those are normal mice. You can see that they increase their body weight fairly steadily. Uh, and the filled uh, circles, the black ones, those would be the uh, knockout mice. So they lack the glutamate transporter. You can see they don't put on weight quite as well. Um, panel B is a little more disturbing. You can see that there's uh, reduced uh, survival. In other words, removing that glutamate transporter actually kills the mice because it leads to seizures, which you can see in panel C. That's a mice, that's a mouse having a seizure. And you can record the seizure activity using EEG, which we'll talk about uh, at the end of this lecture. You can see the EEG in panel D. A normal mouse is going to have little tiny fluctuations uh, in electricity that you can see, showing normal brain activity. But below that, you can see a few areas where you get these giant fluctuations. That would be seizure-like activity that's caused by um, hyper excitability of neurons because those astrocytes aren't cleaning up the neurotransmitter. It's absolutely critical that after neurotransmitter is released that it's quickly removed from the synapse and astrocytes are going to help uh, carry that out. Uh, the astrocytes are going to accomplish this by surrounding the axons, dendrites, and cell bodies of neurons. This way they can help take up that neurotransmitter, but they also are going to give uh, to, the, to the neuron. They're going to supply uh, neurons with all of their, um, all their necessary uh, nutrition that they need because the astrocyte also surrounds blood vessels. All right, That's what we're looking at in that top portion there. CX30 is just a little uh, connexin. It's a, it's a protein that allows uh, astrocytes to communicate with, with one another. The white uh, is GFAP. This is a, a filament, a, a cytoskeletal filament found in astrocytes. But what you can see here is that these white astrocytes are surrounding this tube, and that tube would be a blood vessel. There are blood vessels running all through our brain, and they're surrounded by astrocytes so that the nutrients moving through our blood, uh, namely glucose, can get taken up and then hand it off to neurons. Astrocytes are the middleman. Uh, neurons are very delicate, and if they're exposed to blood, they actually die. So the uh, astrocytes are going to send out what we call an input process to surround essentially the entirety uh, of the blood vessels in our brain. They're going to help form this thing called the blood-brain barrier, and they're going to protect neurons from anything that's potentially toxic in the blood. Then they'll take up good uh, things like glucose, and they'll supply it to neurons. The other extensions of the neuron are going to surround those nodes of Ranvier uh, and, and synapses to buffer the ions and, and neurotransmitters uh, that are moving around in the brain. Because of this, you'd expect astrocytes to have very complicated morphologies, and in fact they do. Um, if you look at their cytoskeleton, it's fairly humble. That'd be the red uh, signal on top. But in the middle, uh, we're looking at uh, a little dye that's been put into that one single cell. So when you look in red, yeah, it looks fairly simple. You, know, you can see the center of the cell. You can see a few processes coming out here and there. But it's actually filling up uh, almost the entirety 
of this illustration here, almost the, in, the entire view, except for that little hole that would, of course, be the cell body of a neuron. Now, neurons are specialized for communication. They communicate with each other. Keep in mind, astrocytes also communicate with each other. All right, what they're going to form are those electrical synapses with one another. They have they're connected by gap junctions, so that uh, when an astrocyte in one area picks up neurotransmitter, it can then spread that out uh, through a network of many many astrocytes. So this increases the buffering capacity of astrocytes. Without those gap junctions, then you only have one astrocyte working by itself. But since astrocytes are actually forming this large network. Now you have hundreds and thousands of astrocytes that are helping buffer uh, the activity of neurons there. And this allows them to absorb far more neurotransmitter than a single astrocyte. Uh, while it is true that um, neurons are specialized for communication, uh, astrocytes also have uh, some, some signals that are propagated within themselves. They don't fire action potentials, but they have these, these waves of calcium. Uh, that are going to spread uh, between cells. What we're looking at here is a, a little fluorescent calcium indicator. And here's a few astrocytes. I've, I've put the arrows there. There's a couple more in the field as well. We have no idea what these really do, uh, but it probably allows the astrocyte to, to spit out things that, that neurons need. So when you see these flashes of light, those are the calcium waves. All right, And so you can see that they're kind of going back and forth between these two cells here. Kind of nifty, uh, but in all honesty, uh, very mysterious at this point. But astrocytes are also communicating with each other. All right, It's not just about neurons. That being said, almost the rest of the class will be focused on neurons. All right, we have one last glial cell uh, to talk about here, and that would be the microglia, which means little glia. These are macrophages. These are the immune system of our brain. So remember, we have that blood-brain barrier. So all the nifty uh, antibodies and immune cells floating around in our bloodstream, they're kept separate from the brain for the most part. So those immune, our immune system isn't really going to enter the central nervous system. It's not going to enter the brain. So if we get an infection or if we have some tissue damage because of brain injury, we need something there to clean it up, and that's the job of the microglia. Normally they're, they're sitting there in a, in, in a kind of quiescent uh, or inactive state and they have their cellular processes branching out. If you look at the illustration on the left there, those are uh, resting microglia. You can see they have some processes. Uh, they're, they're not really too densely uh, collected here. On the right we can see uh, microglia in a region that's been uh, damaged. So in, in a brain region that's been damaged you can see there's a lot more microglia for one and their morphology is very different because microglia actually migrate. They're going to move to sites of injury. So in order to do that, they retract their little cellular processes and they become these little balls and then they wiggle their way to the site of entry. Kind of cool stuff. Uh, microglia do a ton of things uh, in addition to acting as macrophages. Um, they're going to send out a bunch of growth factors as well um, to help guide axons and uh, regulate where blood vessels grow and stimulate the production of new glia like oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. So microglia, while they are largely macrophages, they also have other functions. Now the brain is isolated from the rest of the body by that blood-brain barrier. All right, here what we're looking at some purple uh, astrocyte in feet, right? Remember uh, that that illustration we saw earlier. Here it is in cartoon format. This is surrounding a blood vessel. Of course, we have a red blood cell and erythrocyte right there in the middle to show you this is indeed a blood vessel. There are the endothelial cells uh, surrounding that blood vessel, and they're connected uh, by these tight junctions that prevent stuff in the bloodstream, uh, like uh, small molecules, drugs that we may be taking uh, from leaking out of the blood and into our brain because our neurons are fairly delicate. So the blood-brain barrier is going to make sure that we don't have uh, uh, any toxic substances leaking into the brain. Okay. Um, the blood-brain barrier does get disrupted uh, in cases where we have brain injury, all right, and this is one of the issues with with uh, with 
having repeated blows to the head is that you can disrupt your blood-brain barrier uh, and then lead to kind of a widespread neurotoxicity. Now, some things can just wiggle their way through the blood-brain barrier, very, very small molecules uh, that are less than uh, 400 Daltons or so, and, and uh, very hydrophobic or fat-soluble molecules. But for most other things, um, you're going to have to move through the blood-brain barrier. Okay, um, Gases and, and fat-soluble molecules can just fly on through. Uh, there are transporters uh, between cells. Uh, that'd be the uh, paracellular uh, diffusion there. Uh, there are also transporters on the vascular epithelial cells uh, that will allow certain molecules like uh, glucose or amino acids uh, to move across the blood-brain barrier. Um, and then there's also some uh, endocytic uh, mechanisms. We call it transcytosis. So you're going to bring in vesicles and, and move them to the other side. You don't really need to know the details of this, but you should be aware that uh, our brain very carefully regulates what can enter it. Uh, Glucose is very, very important uh, because without glucose, our brains don't function. Okay, so in order for us to get the glucose uh, from our food into our brain, we have to transport it across the blood brain barrier. And like I said before, this has to be accomplished by astrocytes. In that top panel, we are again looking at GFAP uh, standing, and we can see that they're surrounding a blood vessel. Okay, in the bottom, we can see the little biocytin filled astrocytes in green. There's one, two, three, four, five of them surrounding that red neuron. So the astrocytes are the interface between blood and neuron. If a neuron needs glucose, it must pass through an astrocyte. Here it is in cartoon format. Astrocytes are going to take up glucose. Sometimes they will give the glucose directly to neurons. Sometimes they will uh, first undergo uh, anaerobic metabolism and create pyruvate and then lactate, then ship the lactate onto neurons. Um, there's a pretty nifty way uh, where only the active neurons will receive uh, this glucose or lactate, but we're not going to talk about that. Keep in mind that um, brain function is, is very specialized, very complicated, um, and for right now we'll, we'll just accept that astrocytes know which neurons are active, and so when they take glucose from the bloodstream, they distribute it to the appropriate neuron. This way, uh, the, the metabolic demand of neurons can be met because a more active neuron is going to require more glucose. Just like more active people can eat more and not gain weight. Okay, let's talk about the overall organization of our nervous system. And really what you find is that there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, essentially bifurcations. So there's little pairs. It's, it's A and B. All right, so it's very much binary. Uh, for example, we have the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. We're going to focus on the central nervous system first. And again, we have another pair. We have the brain and the spinal cord. So we separate our nervous system into central and peripheral. We separate our central nervous system into brain and spinal cord. Um, not surprisingly, the brain is where the magic happens. Okay, this is where we're going to integrate information. We're going to create perceptions. We're going to remember things. We're going to create emotion. The brain creates our world. All right, it's going to receive stimuli, sometimes directly. Uh, it could also be through the spinal cord uh, if we're talking about pain or somatosensation. The spinal cord uh, doesn't really create our world. You can have spinal cord damage, and yeah, you won't be able to move parts of your body, but you still retain your personality. All right? Your spinal cord is going to carry out uh, some simple reflexes, but really it's more of a relay between the brain and the body. There's not a whole lot of information processing or perception going on. Um, instead, it tells your brain what it feels, and it sends the signals from your brain out to your muscles. Okay, So it's the input-output for the brain. Now, the brain is not some homogeneous mass of cells. There are different parts to it. Uh, there will be um, areas where we have a whole lot of cell bodies uh, collected, and that would be the gray matter. When you hear gray matter, what you should be thinking is that there's a lot of neurons there. There's their cell bodies, their dendrites, uh, their forming synapses there. White matter, on the other hand, those would be bundles of axons. And what makes it white would be the myelin. Uh, 
okay? That fatty tissue. If you've ever had a piece of meat with a bunch of fat on it, it's white. Fat is white. So is myelin because it's just fat. So the white matter would be bundles of axons wrapped in fat, which we call myelin. They're going to connect the different areas of our brain. And those little discrete areas of the brain uh, that contain cell bodies, we call them nuclei, with the exception of our uh, cortex and other laminar structures. But for the most part, they're little nuclei. So when you hear something like nucleus accumbens, that's just a little region of the brain that has a bunch of uh, neurons there. You'll also notice if you look up top there that of course this you know brain has been sliced open quite a bit so you can actually see the gray matter but you'll notice in the, the parts that are labeled uh, 1 and, and 2 there there's this big cavity. That's the ventricle. Okay, There's, there's a lot of ventricles here and we're, we're seeing one of the lateral ventricles. There are these fluid filled cavities so our brains all have big gaping holes in them that circulate this fluid uh, that helps kind of uh, cushion the brain, uh, collect waste, and, and distribute some nutrition uh, and maintain ionic balance. So a brain isn't a big ball of cells. It's a big ball with regions of, of highly concentrated cells that are connected by white matter surrounding gaping holes of fluid that we call ventricles. And of course, just like every other part of our body, the brain is filled with blood vessels. Okay, And of course, it's surrounded by that blood-brain barrier. But here's a brain. Yeah, it's missing a chunk. But you can see on the surface there, there's all these giant blood vessels. But even within the brain, you can see how the gray matter actually has a pinkish hue to it. That's because of the blood. If there's a part of your body that's alive, it's receiving blood and your brain is very much alive and it's receiving a ton of blood it's using far more than its fair share of your oxygen and glucose and it can only get that from blood okay so it's not just this homogeneous mass there are areas where we have blood vessels running through there's those big ventricles now the uh, central nervous system itself okay yeah we can call it brain and spinal cord but we can further subdivide that as well Okay, it's not that simple that we just have pairs. So the spinal cord, that's our, our relay between brain and body. We get some, some uh, very minimal processing, just enough to carry out reflexes. Like if you touch something hot, you'll quickly remove your hand. You don't have to think about it. Say, oh, this is kind of hot. Maybe I should move. Okay, yeah, I'll move. And then you've already uh, received some fairly severe burns. Spinal cord takes care of that. If it's hot, just take your finger off. Uh, moving on up. Uh, you're going to, to see immediately above the spinal cord there. You hit the medulla, uh, and, and then the pons are sitting right on top of that. The medulla and the pons are going to carry out some very vital functions. Um, they regulate breathing. Uh, they, they regulate our heart rate. Um, and then the pons is going to regulate things like swallowing. The cerebellum is... It means little brain that's sitting right behind uh, the medulla and pons. That's very important for uh, regulating our, our movement. Uh, so complicated um, motor function requires a, a functioning cerebellum. So in diseases where we have cerebellar damage, you see very uncoordinated movements. Uh, just above that, uh, the pons, you're going to have the midbrain. This is a, a relay for our, our sensory information and some autonomic uh, information. Um, more on the autonomic nervous system in a bit. Uh, the midbrain will also help regulate our mood uh, by, by releasing uh, different neurotransmitters uh, such as dopamine uh, to help make us feel good, uh, if you will. Just above the midbrain, uh, we have our diencephalon, which we, we separate into the thalamus and hypothalamus. The thalamus is very important. Um, very little information gets to our, our uh, cerebral cortex without passing through the thalamus. So the thalamus is an important middleman, uh, an important uh, relay station for sensory information. The hypothalamus, as we will see, is a, a very important uh, connection between our brain and our body. Okay, so uh, the hormonal uh, signaling that goes on as we develop or whenever we are in a stressful situation and you start to get sweaty hands and your tummy doesn't uh, feel good, that's because of your hypothalamus releasing hormones into your uh, blood supply, usually via the pituitary.
right on top of our diencephalon there, we have our big blue cerebrum. Okay, this has expanded dramatically throughout evolution, um, and, and this is where we have our higher cognitive functions. This is where we think. This is where we perceive. This is where we create uh, our emotions. This is really where the magic happens. Okay, the cerebrum is certainly the largest part of the human brain. Uh, it's divided into those two hemispheres, and they are going to communicate with one another uh, through this bundle of axons called the corpus callosum. Okay, and we can see that in this illustration here. Those, those white fibers, they allow the two sides of our brain to talk to one another because each side is controlling uh, the opposite side of our body. So our left, cord, our left uh, cerebral hemisphere is controlling the, the right side of our body and the right cerebral hemisphere is controlling the left side of the body. Now, it would be uh, a shame if you couldn't coordinate the activity of your left and right sides of the body. But of course we can, and that's because of our corpus callosum. So our two sides of the brain can communicate, so the two sides of our body uh, can work together. So that whenever we come up with, with plans, or whenever we perceive uh, visual information on the left and right side uh, of, of our visual field, we can put it all together and create one image. We can create one plan for our body. Now below the cortex, and the cortex is just a covering, Okay, if you hear cortex, whether it's the brain uh, uh, or, or your, your kidneys, the cortex is just the outside. Okay, it's that, that covering, that wrinkly surface there. But our cerebrum has other nuclei below uh, the surface. Uh, for example, uh, the basal ganglia. This is a, a collection of subcortical nuclei that are very important uh, for action selection. So when we're making a decision, should I do this or not, uh, well, that, that depends on what our basal ganglia decide. And we'll talk a lot more about the basal ganglia at the end of this class whenever we cover Huntington's and Parkinson's disease. Hip, the hippocampus, very important for uh, episodic memory formation. So you can remember what happens in your life because of your hippocampus. We're going to talk a lot more about the hippocampus in the second half of this class whenever we cover memory function and Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, that loss of memory occurs because of degeneration of the hippocampus. In Parkinson's disease, the inability to move happens because of uh, degeneration of the dopamine neurons that provide critical input to the basal ganglia. Uh, and then finally we have the amygdala. This it just means almond. Uh, it's an almond-shaped region of the brain, very close to the hippocampus, uh, that, that's responsible for our emotions, uh, in particular negative emotions like fear and anger. So what we're going to see here are, are two rats. Uh, they're going to come out and try to get a little treat. You can see it's, it's a little dark bit on the floor, and there's a mechanical cat there. Now one rat has had its amygdala removed. I think it's pretty obvious which one it is. You can see the rat on top um, has the appropriate response. It's absolutely uh, deathly afraid of this mechanical cat. It doesn't want to get caught and eaten. Yeah, it wants the food, uh, but you know it, it doesn't want to die uh, as a result of getting the food. The rat on the bottom has already gone out, had his meal. He or she uh, is good to go. Now this video is still running. Uh, believe it or not, that rat on top is back there thinking about it. Should I come out and get the food? Man, I'm terrified. And the reason that it's terrified is because its amygdala is still intact. The rat on the bottom had both of the amygdala removed, therefore it was deathly afraid. I'm sorry, it, it, it had no fear. Uh, so the rat on the bottom came right out, got the food, even though it was even closer to the cat, went back in. The rat on top is deathly afraid. You can see it's thinking about it. All right, it's going to come out, it's going to give it another go, <coughs> give it a little movement of the cat, it's afraid. This is the appropriate response, and it can only have that appropriate response because it has uh, the correct brain structures intact. There are some people who have damage to their amygdala. You might think it's a good thing to not have negative emotions, but they tend to venture into bad neighborhoods uh, and actually get in quite a bit of trouble. Um, okay. Uh, Let's go back to that cortex. The cortex is very important. Like I said, this is where the magic happens. All right. Now we, we divide our cortex into uh, four different regions. Uh, in the back there, we have our occipital lobe. Okay. So this brain is looking to the left, just to give you some orientation. 
uh, the frontal lobe is in the front. Sometimes names make sense. The cerebellum we can see down there, the little brain, it's not colored. So the occipital lobe, uh, colored red here, this is where we process our visual information. And that makes the most sense, right? Our eyes are at the front of the brain, so we should process that in the back, right? Um, for whatever reason, that's where our, our, our visual processing is done, rather than in the front. Don't know why. Uh, I guess this way it can pass through the thalamus before getting there. The parietal lobe, uh, colored green here, this is where we're going to process our somatosensory information. So whenever someone touches us, uh, whenever, we, we, uh, whenever we hear things, language is going to get processed there as well. The temporal lobe will also process language uh, as well as uh, other sounds. Uh, we're also going to have a lot of memory functions carried out in the temporal lobe down there. And then finally we have the frontal lobe. Uh, this is kind of the, the part of your brain that makes you you. Uh, the very frontal regions of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, is where we construct our consciousness. Um, this is where we plan our actions. Uh, this is where we control our movements. Okay, so the, the, the real magic of consciousness is created in the frontal lobes. Now, of course, within these lobes, there are many different regions. Uh, we have what we call primary and secondary cortices. Uh, primary cortices handle only one type of information. For example, your primary auditory cortex only handles the sounds. That's all it's thinking about. What's the pitch? Um, what's the what's the timber of this? Okay, it's not thinking about meaning. Meaning is going to be constructed in secondary or associational cortices. Secondary and associational are used interchangeably. But it's in those secondary cortices that we're going to integrate information. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take that information about what sound we just he heard and compare it to memories that we have. So memories are stored in the secondary cortices, okay, in the associational cortices. So, okay, I've heard this before. Ah, that's a cat meowing or a dog barking or whatever it may be. Or when you're hearing these words that I'm telling you, well, what do they mean? Well, you first decode what the sounds are in your primary uh, cortices, and then the associational cortices construct the meaning. Now, our nervous system, while it's, it's very complicated, um, there's also some some order to the chaos. Um, we, we have what we call uh, topographic maps where our, or, where our nervous system is organized in a manner that's consistent with our body. Uh, starting at the spinal cord here, depending on which area of the spinal cord you're at, you're going to be controlling different parts of the body. So the top of the spinal cord, uh, so the cervical uh, regions are going to control higher up portions of, of our body, you know, the, the, the neck muscles, uh, our shoulders, uh, and as you move down uh, the spinal cord toward the bottom, you're going to move from the top of your body down to the bottom of your body. And that, that's what we mean by this uh, somatotopic organization. The soma, our body, uh, is organized in our nervous system kind of like it is in real life. So higher up parts uh, of the spinal cord control higher up parts of the body. You can also see this in the brain. So remember that parietal lobe is, is responsible for our uh, somatosensation. Okay, so the, the primary somatosensory cortex. It's also organized in a manner similar to our body. You know, the, if we look on the, the, the bottom there, um, you can see that that blue pseudo colored wrinkly somatosensory cortex you know starting on the left our our throat is near the tongue and the jaw and the lips these are all kind of close to one another you can see they're right next to each other in the somatosensory cortex uh, the the part of our somatosensory cortex that responds to touch on the face is is right next to the part that responds to touching on the nose right next to the eyes right and those are all next to each other on our body the thumb would be next to the fingers and that's near the hand and the arm and the shoulder it all kind of makes sense uh, with the exception of course of the genitalia which are just kind of tacked on right next to our toes um, I don't know about you this doesn't really match with how my body's organized but it does help explain why some people might have a foot fetish you know, if you get a little bit of miswiring there, there could be some crosstalk between your feet and your genitals. Uh, 
I don't know. But anyway, uh, let, let's move on. We're going to now step outside our central nervous system and, and hit that peripheral uh, nervous system. Because uh, it, it's, it's, it's great to have a brain and a spinal cord, but it means nothing if we're not getting information and we're not doing anything with that information. Okay, so remember, we divide our nervous system into central and peripheral. Now, the peripheral portion we then divide again into pairs. We have our somatic nervous system, which controls the body. Soma means body. And our autonomic nervous system. Autonomic uh, controls the automatic uh, functions, so things that we don't have to think about. Okay, the somatic nervous system. Again, we branch. We have two types of neurons. We have sensory neurons and we have motor neurons. Sensory neurons sense the world. What am I feeling? Uh, sensory neurons are going to pick up light and, and allow us to, to see the world. Sensory neurons are going to transmit information about uh, pressure in the air or sound, if you will, uh, or if we touch things. It's sensory neurons uh, that can tell that that the surface is smooth or it's rough uh, or it's sharp. The motor neurons cause us to move, just like a motor causes uh, a car to move. The motor neurons control our muscles. So the, when a motor neuron fires, it causes the muscle to contract and we move. What we're looking at here is a very simple reflex. Remember, the spinal cord carries out reflexes. What we're looking at is a little piece of the spinal cord probably high up on it because we're controlling the arm there. All right, we're, not, we're not low in the spinal cord, that'd be in the legs. So in this illustration, uh, this person has reached out and, and touched a candle because that's a great idea. That, that green uh, sensory neuron is saying, ouch. Uh, it sensed the heat and it's saying, that was stupid. Uh, and it, it, it immediately synapses onto this little red interneuron. Inter just means between, so it's between the motor and the sensory neuron. And it says, uh, that's hot. The inner neuron receives the signal, tells the blue motor neuron, that's hot. Notice we haven't gone to the brain. This stayed right in the spinal cord. Then that blue motor neuron causes uh, an immediate withdrawal of the hand. All right, so if you've ever touched something hot and then removed your hand quickly, that's all in your spinal cord. Your brain didn't have to get involved. Your brain's going to be involved later thinking, well, that was stupid. I really shouldn't have done that. But it's not involved in the actual withdrawal reflex. The autonomic nervous system is also divided. All right, it's divided in two. We have our sympathetic nervous system and we have our parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. Okay, uh, this creates stress responses. This this gets us ready for action. So it's going to draw blood away from the gut and into our muscles. Uh, it's going to cause uh, our our pupils to dilate so we can you know I suppose take in more visual information. Uh, I doubt that that matters if there's sufficient light around, but hey, you know it does that anyway. Uh, it, it causes us to, to no longer salivate because we're not here to eat. Uh, we're here to fight or flee. The parasympathetic nervous system uh, can be summarized as rest and digest, not fight or flight. It's going to control uh, very similar uh, targets, but it's going to have opposite effects on them. All right, now we're not getting ready to get the hell out of here. Here we're going to enjoy a meal. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna digest that meal, so we get salivation. The blood's going to go from our muscles into our gut. If you've ever had that feeling of sluggishness after a meal, it has absolutely nothing to do with tryptophan. That's all bullshit. Don't believe it. It has everything to do with a very normal uh, activation of your parasympathetic nervous system. If you've eaten a meal, that means that there's good stuff in your digestive tract. Uh, and we need to get that into our blood. The only way to do that is to divert more blood to your digestive system so that we can pull out more nutrition from the meal that you just had. And that's what creates that itis, that feeling of sluggishness, not tryptophan. All right? Don't believe the hype. Okay, so for example, these two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic, these are going to have opposite effects. Your heart rate. When your sympathetic nervous system is activated, you're going to have an increase in your heart rate. Oh shit, I gotta do something. I'm stressed. Parasympathetic will decrease it. Okay, relax. There's no reason uh, to run around. Just calm yourself and digest. Uh, the GI tract, all right, your gastrointestinal tract. Um, movement of food through that is, is put on a pause when your sympathetic nervous system is activated. 
All right, and this can lead to tummy aches. Uh, your parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is going to actually stimulate smooth muscle contractions. Uh, now, the organization uh, of, of these two branches of the autonomic nervous system are a little different. Okay, While they do have neurons uh, located in our spinal cord and, in some cases, uh, the brain, they then synapse onto uh, another neuron. So there's the preganglionic neurons in our central nervous system. The postganglionic neurons are in the peripheral nervous system. Now, those postganglionic neurons are going to be uh, located, in some cases, very close to the spinal cord in that uh, sympathetic ganglionic chain. Okay, so in the sympathetic nervous system, it's very close to the spinal cord. That's where the postganglionic neurons are. In the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, instead, the preganglionic neuron projects essentially to the target tissue because it's, it's at that target tissue where the postganglionic neurons are located, not close to the spinal cord in a chain. Instead, uh, they're, they're found on target tissues. So you'll find big collections of postganglionic neurons on your GI tract if it's parasympathetic. The sympathetic neurons that innervate our GI tract are still located close to the spinal cord. Now, our autonomic nervous system is, is uh, very, very important. You should be happy that you have one. Uh, I hope that you've thanked your autonomic nervous system. If you haven't, you really should because it handles a lot of things that you wouldn't want to think about. So your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system are working uh, together to help you maintain homeostasis. Whether you believe it or not, gravity is always trying to bring you down. And part of you is your blood. So when you stand up, maybe you've, you've felt a little lightheaded before, you've gotten some stars, that's okay, uh, that's totally normal. You've essentially stood up out of your blood. Okay, you stood up and gravity pulled your blood down. And it takes a little while for your, your autonomic nervous system to adjust your blood vessels so that it kind of squeezes them in your leg and opens them in your brain to kind of force the blood up. This takes a little time and you might experience a little bit of lightheadedness, but you won't pass out. And that's because you have a functioning autonomic nervous system. Congratulations, not everyone does. Here's a young lady with something called postural hypotension. She doesn't have that functioning uh, barrel reflex that automatically um, redirects blood flow. So she's just gotten up off the couch and she's just gotten down on the floor. What she was doing there is just making little shadows. She's playing with her dog. She stood up out of her blood. Had she had a properly functioning autonomic nervous system, she would have had uh, sympathetic uh, activation uh, to, to, to constrict blood vessels and, and parasympathetic to, to, to relax them, thus force blood up from her legs into her brain. That didn't happen. Gravity won. So she had to lay down very uh, violent manner so that gravity wasn't pulling blood out of her brain. So your autonomic nervous system is going to handle a lot of things for you without you having to think about it. It's a wonderful thing. Your somatic nervous system is the one that you control for the most part. We can freely move our hands around, our arms, our legs, but we don't have conscious control over our blood vessels and frankly you wouldn't want it. All right, let's hit the last part of this lecture. Um, in order to understand how the human brain works, you know, you got two options. You can wait for something bad to happen and then study that person, um, or you can take a look at a living brain. Now, it's much easier to understand brain function in, in rodents because they don't have human rights. You can kill them, take their brains out, and study them. In humans, it's, it's a little more difficult. Um, lesions are, are just uh, very focal areas of brain damage and typically they're caused by strokes. Uh, sometimes they're caused by railroad spikes flying through your head, but those are very rare. Strokes are a lot more common. So whenever you have uh, the, the blockage of a blood vessel, then a portion of your brain is cut off from nutrition and, and that causes the neurons in that region to die off. So depending on where the stroke is, you'll have uh, uh, different symptoms and based on the symptoms that you get and the location of the stroke we can then determine 
well, what that area of the brain does. For example, uh, here's a guy with what we call Broca's aphasia. He's had a stroke uh, that's damaged uh, his Broca's area, and you'll see that his speech is broken. Okay, now um, there are other areas of the brain associated with speech. So there's Broca's area, that's, that's where we're going to produce speech. Uh, you can see that this guy had a very hard time actually creating words. There's another area uh, called Wernicke's area. And this is where we actually create meaningful speech. So we, so we have speech that makes sense. So here we're going to see a patient with uh, Wernicke's aphasia. So with Broca's, it's broken, and with uh, Wernicke's, it's wacky. That's a way of, of remembering that. So um, if that made sense to you, uh, you might want to see a neurologist. Uh, you know, he said a lot of words. The, the meaning of it is, is very difficult to get. So uh, strokes can, can actually uh, tell us quite a bit about uh, what different parts of the brain uh, do because they can be very focal. Sometimes they're more widespread. So of course you have to observe how the person's function changes and then you have to localize the stroke. Where did it occur? Uh, in some cases, you have to wait for them to die and then examine their brain. Nowadays, you can just uh, look using um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which we'll see in, in, uh, in a little bit. Now, of course, it's not just stroke. Um, sometimes, like I said, railroad spikes uh, can cause these lesions. Phineas Gage uh, is a guy who had a, a railroad spike fly through his frontal lobes. So he was a railroad worker. Um, he, he hit a spike into a charge that he didn't know was there. It flew up through his cheek, uh, through his eye, and then through his uh, orbital frontal cortex. And it flew right out through his skull. Now, your frontal lobes don't carry out any vital functions. Remember, that's down in the lower parts of your brain, like the medulla and the pons. They were fine, so he could breathe. Uh, your frontal lobes don't really have much to do with your coordination per se, so he could walk just fine, he could still talk, but his personality had changed uh, a little bit. He, he wasn't um, as well behaved. That's the story anyway. Who the hell knows if it's true? Um, patient HM is, is another very notable uh, lesion case. This is a guy who had epilepsy, and in order to to control his seizures, they removed the portions of his brain that were hyperactive, and that would include his hippocampus. And uh, he was then stuck in essentially the same day for the rest of his life. He, he worked with um, uh, Dr. Miller uh, for 20 years, and he never uh, ha had any recollection of her. Worked with her every day. Uh, patient SM uh, had a rare genetic disorder that caused her, her amygdalae to um, not develop properly and so she was lacking them and she had no fear response she would handle snakes 
she'd walk into bad neighborhoods and, and get attacked. Uh, she'd receive death threats because she wouldn't she wouldn't pick up on people uh, on their social cues that they didn't want her around. Uh, so it's actually very dangerous to not have that amygdala there. Um, then there are of course split brain patients where they have their cor corpus callosum cut, and and they're they're very important for studying hemispheric differences. Um, but these are very rare cases, you know. Like I said, people have human rights, and so it's very difficult to go in and and futz with their brain function. So what we're left with are non-invasive measures like EEG. All right, we we saw some EEG recordings from those uh, those uh, glutamate transporter knockout mice. So you can you can pick up um, seizures. You know, you can pick up big changes uh, in, in brain activity. But what you're getting here is incredibly noisy because you're measuring electrical activity, which is very minute, in the brain through layers of fluid, uh, connective tissue, your skull, and then your skin, which of course is more fluid and connective tissue, uh, and and muscle, and and possibly even hair. You know. If, you're one of the many folks out there with a head of hair. All of this introduces noise, and so you're picking up uh, tiny little sub-microvolt changes. So it's in incredibly noisy, and it also has very poor spatial resolution. You have no idea where, in particular, these signals are coming from. You know, you're going to put an array of electrodes, as you can see in this image, on someone's head, so you can tell the very front of the brain from, you know, kind of the middle and the back, but where is it? You know, is it, uh, is it, is it going to be in, in uh, uh, you know, the portion of your somatosensory cortex that's dedicated to your, your fingers or, or, you know, your thumb or your palm? You, you don't have that kind of spatial resolution, and you can't really see anything below the surface. You do have excellent temporal resolution, though. All right, so you, you can measure very fast changes in the electrical activity. You just don't have a good idea of where it's coming from. It, it's better than nothing. Right, I know that doesn't sound like much, but it's true. It's better than nothing. Um, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, this is going to measure uh, brain activity uh, in, in deep brain regions uh, or those on the surface. You can do this while subjects are awake, just like EEG. Uh, so you don't have to kill anybody, which is nice. Uh, people usually don't like that. And you have excellent spatial resolution, but the problem with this is that it takes time to acquire fMRI data, and so your temporal resolution is fairly poor because the activity of neurons uh, operates on the millisecond time scale. And here you're limited to seconds, so you're about a thousand times too slow, really. Um, that being said, typically... Uh, neuronal activity is going to change for a decent enough period of time that you can pick out changes um, in 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 uh, brain activity. Now, while I do say that it has good spatial resolution, by no means are we visualizing individual nerve cells or individual synapses. You know, we're looking at uh, like cubic centimeter chunks of brain, which again, it's better than nothing. You know, you have to study the brain somehow, and, you know, those pesky human rights cause us to use techniques like EEG and fMRI. Kind of a nifty, um, newer method would be transcranial magnetic stimulation, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Transcranial, through the cranium, so through the skull, we don't have to make any holes or anything like that. Magnetic, we're going to use magnetic waves. Magnetism and, elect and electricity are, are essentially interchangeable stimulation. So we can stimulate, we can also inhibit uh, regions of the brain using magnetic waves. What we're looking at here uh, is, is a lady, of course, wearing a white coat. That means that she's uh, a scientist or a medical professional, who knows. And she's holding these, these two magnetic coils. They're both going to send magnetic waves that are going to focus on a very small region uh, in this young lady's head here. Now the issue with TMS is that it has to be near the surface. Okay, We can't stimulate um, deep brain regions, but we can stimulate the cortex pretty well. All right, So we can affect uh, people's uh, sensations and perceptions and, as well as their motor output. 
this is kind of cool. Uh, here's a little video of someone who's going to have uh, a TMS performed on her. As you can see, it's going to be the left side of her brain, and so the right side of her body is going to move. She's going to move her Hi, arm. Hi, Recon. Welcome to our laboratory. Today we're going to show you how the transcranial magnetic stimulator works. So first thing, Yoshi's going to put the magnetic coil over top of the area of my motor cortex that's responsible for the muscles of my hand and forearm. Once she's there, she's going to deliver a magnetic pulse. Oh, and you probably saw my arm twitch there. And we can also see this response over here on the oscilloscope because we've measured it using the EMG electrodes over the muscles of my hand and forearm. Kind of nifty stuff. You don't have to hurt anybody, you don't have to kill them, you don't have to open up any holes, but you can actually manipulate their brain activity in real time. Uh, so the somatosensory cortex as well as the motor cortex, those both have those uh, uh, topographic uh, maps and so they can tell kind of where they're going to stimulate based on where they're sending the magnetic waves. Pretty nifty stuff. They move it a little bit further back, then rather than moving, uh, the subject is going to actually have some sort of sensation. Uh, now, there are, of course, other ways of measuring uh, brain activity. You can record um, electrical activity uh, in deep brain regions by implanting electrodes. This is very rare, and you tend to see this in animal studies. We'll talk more about that uh, in, in the next uh, lectures whenever we cover patch clamp recordings. All right, that covers it for lecture one. If you have any questions on the material, don't hesitate to send me uh, an, an email, uh, and I'll, I'll